covering over the coming weeks as we look at our Easter series. And tonight we're looking at the cross. The cross is the universal symbol of Christianity, and yet so often the most misunderstood. We're going to try and unfold a little bit of what really is the very heart of the Christian faith, the cross of Jesus. The Bible says, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. We've been doing a series called Mirror to Mirror that's looking at some of those themes that run right the way through the Bible, right the way through history. And nowhere is that more true than the cross itself. So right from the earliest passages of the Bible with Abraham and Isaac, the story of the people of God in Egypt and the exodus out as the Passover feast and the lamb is slain and the means of salvation and release through that sacrifice, all were pointing forward to things that would happen centuries later. And so throughout the Bible, we have this unfolding story of which the cross is at the heart of it. Indeed, history itself, we date it, don't we, as BC, before Christ, and AD, Anno Domino, as if the cross of Christ is at the very center of history. We're going to try and unfold the significance of the cross. So as we look at the Passover itself, Right from that day when that Passover happened in Egypt, every year since then, Passover has been celebrated down through the ages, century after century. So when Jesus comes on the scene, in fact, the Passover is still happening and we're going to begin our reading tonight with where Jesus is about to celebrate the Passover just before he goes to the cross. And he's going to take that very meal itself and turn it into a new significance, what we now celebrate as communion or Eucharist or breaking of bread. And it was that unbroken theme we see through history that we're going to focus on tonight. So our first reading is from Luke's Gospel, and it's the story of where Jesus goes up to prepare. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it, they asked. He replied, as you enter the city, A man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished. Make preparations there. Luke goes on then to record the Passover experience, which we'll touch on a little later. And beyond the Passover to Gethsemane itself, and then finally, to the cross. And here in Luke 23, we begin to take up the story of the cross. Luke 23, and beginning uh, as Jesus is crucified. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him. There along with the criminals, one on its right and the other on his left, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. They divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine, vinegar, and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews of the Jews. Then follows into our final reading these amazing moments where the whole of the earth goes in darkness from midday when normally the sun is its highest in the Middle East until three o'clock in the afternoon and we just have this amazing record of those moments. It was now about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon for the sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, 
into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. Father, we pray you would come now by your spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. As we take this theme of the cross, so familiar, such the heart of Christianity, help us to gather something fresh. Give us a fresh revelation of what the cross really can mean to us today. As we begin this journey of Easter week, Lord, may it not just be familiar ground, old stories being retold, but fresh revelation that affects our lives. In Jesus' lovely name, amen. Amen. The cross is at the heart of our Christian faith, and uh, it wasn't just an accident of history. It was something of an unfolding purpose of God. We get a glimpse of even that unfolding purpose as we come to this Passover meal and Jesus is about to take the Passover with his disciples. And even the way it happened, we were thinking this morning with Palm Sunday today of the way in which, even in detail, Jesus prepared the way on Palm Sunday when he sent the two disciples ahead of him and said, uh, you know, you'll come into a village, you'll find a colt tied up there and uh, I want you to unloose the colt and bring it to me. The, 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 The owner of the colt will say, what are you doing? You just say, the Lord has need of it. And Off they went and came to a village. That's exactly what they found. But here now, as we come to this Passover preparation, again, this is not as if it's just um, unexpected circumstances suddenly overtaking them. And it's almost as if God has an unfolding plan. And so Jesus says, uh, I want you, Peter and John, to go ahead to Jerusalem. And uh, when you enter the city, you'll find a man carrying a water pitcher. Now that in itself was really unusual because in the Middle East it's rare you'll find a man catching, you'll see plenty of women carrying their pitchers from first thing in the morning, usually they go out early before the sun gets high and uh, you'll see hundreds of them, but to see a man carrying a pitcher, you almost the disciples think, well, that'll never happen, but as they arrive in the city, there's a man carrying a pitcher. They follow him, come to a house, and there is an upper room, almost as if it's already been planned and prepared. And so it is throughout this unfolding story of the cross. Even the very hour when Jesus says, Father, the hour has come. There were many times in Jesus' life where people tried to precipitate him into action. If you are, you are, then show yourself to the people. Even his own brothers and sisters said that at one stage. But Jesus would say, my hour has not yet come. It's not even just if it wasn't the right year, the right day. My hour has not yet come. As if every hour, every moment, there was an unfolding purpose in history. that was working towards this moment in history. And as Jesus, there in that Passover moment, he takes that Passover meal, but now gives to a new significance. He takes the bread and breaks it, he takes the cup, he says, this is my body given for you. This is the New Testament, my blood shed for you. Somehow Jesus was taking something that over the centuries had spoken of that Passover lamb and God's forgiveness. When John the Baptist had first seen John on the Jordan banks, he'd said, wow, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. As if this is what all Jesus' life had been preparing him for this moment. I've often said, you know, people do heroic acts. You hear sometimes stories from maybe somebody leaping into a frozen river or running into a burning house or in times of war, amazing heroic things and being interviewed afterwards, you know, you ask the person, how do you manage to do it? And often they say, to be honest with you, if I'd thought about it, I could have never done it. If I knew it was going to happen, I could have never done it. What must it have meant for somebody who throughout his life knew this was what lay ahead of him, knew this was God's plan and purpose, that unfolding purpose in history? And Jesus knew as it unfolded, even there with his own disciples, as he says, one of you is going to betray me. And the amazing sense in which, even for that bunch of disciples, God's unfolding purpose is in their lives. And beyond that Passover meal, on to Gethsemane itself. I was sharing the other day a little bit of, Gethsemane is still there today. In fact, I think Greg and Claire have recently visited uh, that part of the world and uh, there and uh, uh, I can remember Pam and I spending quite some time. We spent a, a few months in the Middle East and spent a month at the Hebrew University. This is many years ago and uh, visited some of these amazing sites. And uh, in fact, Pam and Mark are going there later this year. If you want to go to the Middle East and see some of these amazing sites, book in. I'm not sure I think there's still some places, but there we are. But uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane, 
there are still those ancient olive trees. You know, olive trees have an amazing lifespan. And it's believed that some of those olive trees there in the Garden of Gethsemane, in fact, span back 2,000 years that some of those olive trees, they got these really gnarled old roots as if, and I remember Pam and I kneeling beside some of those roots thinking, was this where Jesus with his disciples knelt? He took his disciples in to that Garden of Gethsemane. And this is where we see something of the amazing significance of prayer. For us this week, this Easter week, Running power with all the other activities is what we call 24-7 prayer. So here in the prayer rooms, in the various congregations as well, day and night throughout this week, we're going to have the opportunity to pray. People will have already booked in for those prayer times, for a chance to be able to somehow during this Easter week catch something of that spirit of prayer. And here throughout Jesus' life, we see how the heart of his life was this constant rhythm of prayer. But nowhere so more than here in this Garden of Gethsemane. He says to his own disciples, watch with me and pray. One of the things God's been teaching me about prayer, and I'm, I'm constantly learning more about prayer, and uh, it's just the significance sometimes, what I would call prayer vigiling. That is praying for something as it's happening. Jesus was about to go through a time of anguish of soul. He cries out to his father, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. And as he's to go through this time of anguish, he says to his own disciples, watch and pray with me. As I, as I go through these moments of anguish, pray with me. And there's something about praying for somebody. Maybe, I don't know, it might be you've got a, a serious operation coming up in a, a week or so's time. And you say to someone, could you pray for that operation? And you say, certainly, I'll, I'll pray for you. And you pray with them maybe. But it's another thing to say to that person, what time is the operation? Well, it's, it's actually nine o'clock on next Tuesday. What would it be nine o'clock next Tuesday, but actually praying as it's happening? It's what I would call prayer vigiling. It's watching over a situation in prayer as it's happening. And there's something really significant about that in prayer, where you feel as if you're actually praying now into a, a set of circumstances that are happening. Constantly around our world, there are so many things happening for us to be praying for. Do you know, back in, in 2009, there was a, a young woman who was working in her fields in Pakistan. A really hot day, she was a relatively poor family. And she had some really awkward neighbors. She had not long become a Christian, which was a challenge because she was the only one in her community as a Christian. And uh, her neighbors had really made life hell for her. And uh, she was working away in her fields and the neighbor was in the next field and began to mock her and uh, uh, take the mick out of her as a Christian and believing in all that. And uh, she turned to this neighbor and just in a genuine expression said, I believe in the Lord Jesus and that he died on the cross to save me. What has your prophet Muhammad ever done to save you? And we think, well, anybody could say that in a rash moment. Her neighbor reported her. They came and arrested her. That was June 2009. The court case was in November 2010. For those words, she was found guilty under the notorious blasphemy law, and she was sentenced to death by hanging. Those very words. Tomorrow morning is the appeal case. For her. I'm going to go to the prayer room afterwards tonight and tomorrow. I want to just sense that as that case is going on, I want to be praying. There'll be a hundred people around the world praying for her. But there are many situations around our world for our persecuted church. One of the, tonight we're going to have an extended time of prayer later and we want to pray for the persecuted. We want to believe that tonight, crossing barriers of countries and language and culture, I can't travel to Pakistan tomorrow morning. I won't even know the language that will be, the court will happen in. But through prayer, through prayer, I can influence and impact those situations. There's something about booking in even this week with 24 seven, you can actually book in, you've got the various hours of the day. Do you know what Jesus said to his own disciples? Could you not watch with me one hour in prayer? That's a challenge to us, isn't it, this week? Just to watch for one hour in prayer. There's something about prayer that's really significant in shaping our world. Beyond Gethsemane, Jesus went through that anguish and sadly for his own disciples though he'd asked them to pray with him. It wasn't they weren't willing. Jesus says the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak. They fell asleep each time. For many of us the challenge often in our prayer lives is the many distractions and the, how to be able to keep focused in prayer and many of us feel real guilty that we ought to pray more often. How do we sense that real quickening of the Holy Spirit in prayer and that spirit of prayer? I'd love to feel this week during this prayer time during this week of Easter week there's a fresh stirring of that praying but for Jesus having gone through that anguish of Gethsemane we then go through all the false trial and the mocking that happens 
Some of you have seen the Passion of the Christ, the gruesome, cruel treatment that Jesus went through. That paved area where they mocked and whipped and beat Jesus. In that paved area near the barracks has been uncovered in relatively recent years. Jerusalem itself has got sacked many times and many times in its history got buildings destroyed and decayed. So to get down to the actual level of where Jesus stays was, you've got to dig down. So it's quite a, a little bit lower down. You, you can go down some of these um, tunnels down to the areas. You actually find so there's an area. I remember Pam and I visiting. It's called the, in the Bible, it says that where his trial was going, it was a place called the pavement. And you actually, they've uncovered that place near the barracks of the pavement. You know, they mocked Jesus. They put a crown of thorns on his head and a, a purple robe and pretended as it were mocking his king. Hail king, they said. Do you know, in that paved area, as they uncovered it, they actually have inscribed some of those ancient inscriptions. On the side. There's all sorts of little inscriptions of some of those who are facing death. They actually have a crown and a game of king that they used to play with some of the prisoners. Actually, in the paved area, you can see the description of it today. It's amazing how it unfolds now, the story of the cross, as Jesus has taken to Calvary itself, the place of a skull. Even crucifixion itself. Here's a fascinating thing through history, the unfolding pattern of... You see, it had been prophesied years before, that amazing passage in Isaiah 53 of the suffering servant led like a lamb to the slaughter. But even the details of it all. You see, crucifixion was an unknown means of execution in those days when Isaiah wrote those words. Right back in those early days, even when the Psalms were written. The Romans introduced persecution, uh, introduced crucifixion as a very cruel means of public execution. The cruelest it was known where you nailed a, a body to a stake and hung it in the heat of the day. But it was meant to be a, a kind of deterrent. So they would put above the cross the names of the crimes they committed. So as you went by, it was in a public place by the marketplace. You'd think, goodness me, I better never do that crime. So crucifixion itself was unknown before the Romans. But you know, in Psalm 22, in Psalm 22 has amazing detail. This was written centuries before the Roman Empire began. Okay, before even the Romans introduced crucifixion. But here in Psalm 22 it describes, it says, they will pierce my hands and my feet. It even describes what will happen when those soldiers part of the perks, if you were on duty for crucifixion day, one of the perks was, they usually, the prisoners didn't have any money left by them, but they had their clothes, they would strip them in order to crucify them, and they would then divide the garments among them, tear them along the seams, and that was part of your perk for being on duty that night. When it came to Jesus' inner garment, there was no seam, and so they cast lots for it. Psalm 22, written centuries before Jesus was born in Bethlehem, before the Roman Empire began. They will pierce my hands and my feet. They will divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothes. In the same psalm. Even the details of the cry of the crowd who would have no interest in fulfilling those messianic scriptures. In fact, quite the opposite. And yet as they cry and they mock him, save yourself if you are who you are. As they mock him. Psalm 22. They pierced my hands and my feet. They divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothes. The crowd cried, save yourself if you are who you are. Centuries before. This was no accident of history. This was no kind of just way in which unfortunate circumstances coalesced together and caused this act. This was God's eternal purpose. There was something so significant about the cross that was for the salvation of the world. And even more significant in that psalm is not even just the acts of the soldiers or the crowd, but the cry of Jesus from the cross. You know, as he hung there on the cross, in those hours of darkness from noon until three o'clock in the afternoon, there's that total eclipse of the sun. It's interesting how history records that amazing event. And even now, even further ways, you discover that, that amazing eclipse that happened at this time. Darkness across the face of the earth for three hours. And then Jesus cries out those words, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
the opening words of Psalm 22, written centuries before Jesus was born in Bethlehem, centuries before the Roman Empire began. The opening words are, the same psalm that says, they pierced my hands and my feet, they divided my garments among them and cast lots. The crowd will cry, save yourself if you are you are. The opening words are, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was here in that cry of Jesus we catch the significance in the very heart of the cross. In those hours of darkness, Jesus experienced the eternal consequences of human sin. Your selfishness and pride, my vanity and greed, all the wrong things I've ever done or thought or intended. The Bible speaks about outer darkness. The Bible speaks about separation from God. It says that your sins have separated between you and God. I often use the illustration on a lovely sunny day like this. Well, it's like when the cloud comes in front of the sun. The sun is still there, but you can't feel it any longer. When you have a, one of those really cloudy days, you can't feel it. And you might even argue there is no such thing as the sun. It's not there's no sun. It's just that something's come between us and the sun. That's what human failure and disobedience and sin has done. It separates us from God. It comes between us and God. Like darkness. The Bible speaks of ultimate separation from God. To be in existence without God, it calls outer darkness. Hell is never going to be a place where God is going to be there stoking a fire and twisting our arm and said we should have believed. It would be the absence of God. The total absence of God. Now I've known people here. I remember a, a PhD student. I was having a discussion just up the end of this road here at some stage. He said, well, that won't be too bad. I've lived 24 years of my life without God. So if I've got to... What's, yeah, but you've lived in God's world. You've enjoyed the beauty and all the benefits of God's creation, God's presence. You've experienced something of love and reality, even though you may not acknowledge God or anything about God, but you've enjoyed the benefits of that in an existence that reflects God's creation. But to go in an existence without God is total darkness, utter darkness. When Jesus hung upon the cross, remember Jesus had never sinned. No cloud had ever come between him and his father. He'd never experienced separation from his father. I and the father are one. But in these hours of utter darkness, here contracted into time, he experienced the eternal consequences of that outer darkness. And he sensed a separation from his father. He never ever, because he never sinned. Ever, but he cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Jesus was experiencing the eternal consequence of my selfishness and sin, my pride, my vanity, every wrong thing that we've ever done, here contracted into time. Jesus was carrying in his own body the sins of the world. It was beyond just the physical pain. The passion of the Christ only depicts physical pain. It was beyond the humiliation of mocking the creator of the world, spat upon by his own creatures. Here was an anguish of spirit beyond what we could imagine to experience a sense of separation from his father, to experience the eternal consequence. He was not made to sin, but made to be sin, to experience the consequences of our sin. So real, so significant, this moment in history that all history have been working towards and all history since has been affected by, still now, 2,000 odd years later, this is what makes the difference in a human life. This is what can change everything. This is when a person can pass from death to life. This is the gift of God that is eternal life. It's not just like a tablet or a medicine. It's not just a good thought. It's not just, this is something that changes eternally. Eternal life doesn't begin when I die. Eternal life begins the moment that by faith I believe the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. I can still remember the night that happened for me. It was October the 4th, many, many years ago. But something changed deeply inside of me. It wasn't just a matter of going to church now. It wasn't just a matter of reading the Bible. It wasn't just a matter of singing. Something had changed inside. But you know what made it? It was that moment in history. It's what Jesus did on the cross that made it possible for me now. 2,000 years later, I know an experience of forgiveness. Like having a bath inside. Like a new beginning. Like a new life. Eternal Whoa. life. It's not just, amen, eternal life is, is not just life after death. 
It's the life of the eternal in me now. I'm born of God's spirit. There's a new life that's begun in me. The Holy Spirit has brought to life in me that new life in Jesus. Wonderful, wonderful. It's the cross that's the heart of that. It's the cross that's made it possible. It's like as if a door has been opened to heaven itself. It's like a door into God's presence has been opened. You see, those final words we read, as Jesus from noon to three in the afternoon experienced that outer darkness, cried those words, it is finished. Once and for all. No more animal sacrifices that pointed forward to that time. No more Passover feast that had celebrated that. Now, it's a communion that just looks back to remember the wonder. The body and blood of Jesus given for me. In that moment, he'd opened a way. So powerful was it that it says that as he cried those words, it's finished. The curtain. There was this huge curtain in the temple that separated the ordinary from the holy of holies, the Shekinah glory, the place that nobody could go in, only a high priest and only that once a year. It was so sacred that when he went in, he'd have to have a rope tied around his waist that trailed out under the carpet, underneath the, the curtain, in case anything happened, because he was usually an old man by the time he became high priest. You say, well, I don't know if anything happened to him. He had bells on the bottom, so he, had, he knew if he was still moving, anything happened. He couldn't go inside, he couldn't go near. This was the Shekinah, the Shekinah glory. The very presence of God. But in that moment on the cross, as Jesus died, that curtain, that veil was torn. Not by any human hands, it was torn from top to bottom. This was God's breaking in, opening that new and living way into his presence. A wonder of it. <laughs> That's why for us today, when we come to pray, when we come to worship, we have access. When we pray, we pray in Jesus' name. It's not like I've got to go to a priest and ask them to pray on my behalf. It's not like I've got somebody to offer a sacrifice on my... Now I have ready access as I come in the name of Jesus. I have power and authority in that name. As I come in worship, he's made a new and living way into God's presence. And this week of Easter, our prayer is that somehow that may just come afresh to us. That somehow... It so stirs us, not just that we live in the reality of that, but we just can't help sharing it with everybody else. There's a world, a lost world around us. Jesus gave his life for us. The cost of discipleship. Even for those first disciples, one betrays them, another denies them, the rest run away. They were just ordinary people struggling with life and it all. But God empowered them by his spirit. For you and I today, if we try and do it in our own strength, we'll end up just the same. Struggling, embarrassed, but when we experience that power of God's spirit to realize the wonder of that cross of Jesus has made available as this new life, there's something that stirs in us to want to share that new life in a world around us. I'm going to pray as we close and we're going to then move into a time of prayer. We want to take up some of the things we've shared. We want to pray for that persecuted church. The name of that young woman I mentioned who's got her appeal court tomorrow is Aasia. Aasia. Tomorrow it's life and death for her. Wouldn't it be amazing if here, hundreds of miles away, by prayer, we could affect, bring justice and freedom. For our world, we long to bring justice and freedom to our world. It's often through our prayers that we can bring that breakthrough. Somehow as we pray tonight, let's sense we're making a difference in our world. It's not just for my particular needs, but for the world around us. That this Easter, for thousands of people, they may come to discover the true meaning of the cross that good news, that gospel of our Lord Jesus. Let's stand together as we pray. Father, we thank you again tonight that you so loved the world that you gave your one and only son, the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Lord, we never want to lose the sense of wonder. We don't want to feel it's just some religious ritual in the calendar of Easter but just a fresh revelation. Help us, everyone here tonight, to glimpse something fresh of the wonder of the cross. Calvary, O oh Calvary, mercy's vast, unfathomed sea, love, eternal love to me. Jesus, we adore thee. Fill our hearts, Lord, with worship and wonder. 
Fill us with your Holy Spirit with a boldness to share this good news with a dying world. Thank you, Lord. That gift of God is eternal life. Hallelujah. Teach us to pray, Lord. Stir in us now a spirit of prayer. Just as you said to those disciples in that garden, watch and pray with me. Help us tonight, Lord. There are situations in our world that you're watching over tonight and you're inviting us to watch with you as you ever live to make intercession. Teach us to pray. In Jesus' lovely name. Amen.